Okay, thanks Gia for the nice introduction and thanks to the meeting organizers and chairs for inviting me here. Um, so I think primary CNS lymphoma is becoming a very interesting disease and I'm gonna talk about what's new in the approach to it and uh, talk about some, really focus on some novel strategies that are working uh, very well in this disease. Um, I have no disclosures. Um, so I think when we have a newly diagnosed patient with primary CNS lymphoma, it's very controversial how they should be treated. There really is no standard. Um, and most of these people are older, they're in their 60s and 70s, and while high-dose therapy and transplant is promising, it's really difficult to give those types of treatments to patients who are over the age of 60. Um, this is a nice uh, review from Steve Ansel from a few years ago, and uh, really shows the paradigm, I think how most of us think about the approach to uh, the treatment of primary CNS lymphoma. If somebody's a transplant candidate, um, usually a younger patient, um, high-dose methotrexate, and if they respond, autologous stem cell transplant. If they don't, um, whole brain radiation treatment. And if they're, if they're older and not a transplant candidate, then high-dose methotrexate, um, plus or minus cytarabine, um, I think has been the standard that most people have used. Um, I think it's really interesting if you look at the evolution of primary CNS lymphoma therapy. These are uh, the two cooperative group studies that have been done in the US. Uh, the first one was done by the RTOG. Um, they gave a regimen MVP plus radiation treatment. And the second study was led by Jim Rubenstein and uh, in this study, they gave MTR followed by EA consolidation. But, you know, as you, as you can see here, these patients don't do very well. Um, the, um, you know, the long-term survival rate is in these two studies between 25 and, and 50%. Um, so the results are much worse than for systemic uh, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. There are a lot of promising uh, trials and uh, studies. Um, I'm not going to list them all, um, but uh, one that was recently published was the IELSG32 study. And uh, they um, randomized patients to three different arms. Um, basically, the arms were methotrexate and cytarabine based, but one arm also had pyotipa. And um, in that arm, uh, Shown here is progression-free and overall survival. Uh, patients did better. Thiotipa has been around for a long time, but it's interesting that um, it appears to be very effective in this disease. So, um, I mean, conceptually, where are we with the treatment of primary CNS lymphoma? Um, High-dose approaches and transplant are um, associated with good results. But for the most part, if you look at the studies, the patients are younger. The median age of patients is less than the median age of a typical patient with this disease. Um, and there's high toxicity associated with these approaches. Radiation treatment is effective, um, but it's not curative for the most part. And um, of course, highly toxic. So if we can develop strategies that um, obviate the need for that, that's very important. Um, and in, in terms of the challenges research-wise in this disease, uh, Therapeutic progress has, has been really inhibited by several issues. Um, it's difficult to do biopsies. This is a rare disease. Um, so I think compared to systemic diffuse starch B cell lymphoma, the tumor biology and microenvironment of primary CNS lymphoma is poorly understood. Um, I think instituting optimal trials is challenging. Uh, the performance status of these patients is very different for the most part to patients with systemic uh, diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So it's really difficult to get these patients on clinical trials. So um, in terms of our understanding of the disease, I think a lot has happened over the last few years. So over 90% of primary CNS lymphomas are diffuse large B cell lymphomas. You rarely have other types of lymphomas as shown here. And interestingly, um, Almost all these uh, primary CNS lymphomas resemble the ABC subtype of nodal diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Um, the NF kappa B pathway is typically active. If you look at the various mutations that you see in systemic ABC, like CART11, L265, MyD88, uh, CD79B, these are very, very common. Um, so in terms of thinking um, about how to treat this disease and novel approaches, um, 
This is, uh, th these are various mechanisms of NF-kappa B activation, and uh, BTK is an important uh, step in activating NF-kappa B, and of course, ibrutinib inhibits that. So going back to systemic diffuse large B cell lymphoma, um, this uh, was the basis for a study in systemic large cell. Uh, these are cell line studies uh, looking at ABC and GCB cell lines and how they respond to ibrutinib. And ibrutinib is uh, selective for um, ABC cell lines over GCB cell lines. So that was the hypothesis that led to a study um, of single agent ibrutinib in patients with relapse and refractory um, diffuse large B cell lymphoma. The hypothesis was that patients with the ABC subtype would have a better uh, response and a better outcome. And as you can see from this waterfall plot and from um, the response, patients with ABC um, had a much better outcome. 40% uh, of them responded um, compared to just one patient with G GCB. It's interesting though on the waterfall plot that a number of GCB cases um, had, had some response but didn't meet PR criteria. And this study was interesting. Um, in a subset of patients, a mutational analysis was done um, correlating uh, various mutations with outcome. Um, the numbers here are very small, but it was interesting and predictable that those patients who had a CART11 mutation did not respond to ibrutinib, and the ones who did respond best had both a uh, CD79B and a MIDE 88 mutation. So, Coming back to primary CNS lymphoma and um, using this uh, information in terms of thinking about how to treat it, it's really interesting when you look at the biology of primary CNS because if you look at the proportion of cases that have got a MIDE 88 mutation um, in various studies, it's between 80 and 90 percent compared to just 30 percent in uh, systemic ABC diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Just um, also interesting that um, as we look at different types of ABC lymphoma more and more. Um, if you look at primary cutaneous uh, lymphoma leg type or primary testicular lymphoma, these are ABC lymphomas, uh, but they also have a much higher uh, proportion of cases that have got a mighty 88 mutation. And similarly, if you look at CD79B, um, it's mutated in 20% of systemic ABC, but in primary CNS, it's mutated in over 50%. So, um, a very high proportion of primary CNS lymphomas have got both a MIDE 88 and a CD79B mutation. So um, that's uh, interesting in terms of thinking about um, strategies to treat this disease. Um, so we um, really considered that and hypothesized that uh, using a BTK inhibitor in this disease would be effective. Um, and also looking back at the history of therapeutics of this disease, um, the, the, the drugs that have been used, like methotrexate and cytarabine, they're not drugs that you would ever give to a patient with systemic diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So we, when we, we, we wanted to test out ibrutinib, but we also wanted to try to put together a novel platform based on um, experience with uh, systemic diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So we used the, the EPOC platform, which is a standard regimen in large cell, and we included the drugs uh, that w went across the blood-brain barrier, and where they didn't go across, we substituted drugs uh, that were in the same class. So atopazide does cross the blood-brain barrier, so we included that. Prednisone doesn't, but dexamethasone does, so we used that. Um, there's always been controversy about how effective vincristine is or what its contribution is to curability in large cells, so we didn't use that. Cyclophosphamide doesn't cross, but temozolomide does. Um, it's also an alkylator, uh, so we use that. Doxorubicin doesn't cross, but doxyl does, so we use that, and we use rituximab, which is effective in brain PTLD. At the time that we started our study, we didn't know if ibrutinib crossed or not, um, so we included that as well. Um, and this is the regimen that we used, uh, dose-adjusted Teddy or, um, and really, um, we attempted to maximize CNS penetration of effective agents and also target BCR signaling with ibrutinib. Um, we gave six cycles of therapy to patients, and we had a window before we gave any chemotherapy to test the efficacy of ibrutinib in this disease and also check if it got into the CSF by doing PK studies. Uh, we treated patients who were 18 years and older, um, and they were all EBV negative. Um, and what did we find? We have so far treated 18 patients. Um, the median age of patients is 65. Um, most patients were males. Um, 
In terms of uh, looking at the PKs of ibrutinib, we measured that in, in all patients. Shown here are the first six patients. And um, the top two curves are the um, PKs of ibrutinib and its active metabolite in the serum, and the bottom two curves are its, um, its, its PKs in the CSF. But this shows you that uh, ibrutinib gets into the CSF, um, as does its active metabolite very well. These are detailed uh, PK results. Um, and importantly, um, it shows you here that um, a very high proportion of ibrutinib penetrates uh, the CNS. And uh, if you look at critically the hours above the IC50, um, it ranges from uh, 3 to 10 uh, with various dose levels. So in terms of response, um, there were 16 uh, patients that were valuable for response to ibrutinib alone. Uh, one patient uh, progressed on ibrutinib, but as you can see here, all the other patients responded. And uh, this is in that 14-day window. Uh, and, and shown here is the percentage reduction that these patients had. So you can see it ranges from 30% to 93 or 94%. Uh, so the drug is very active in this disease. And this was before these patients received any chemotherapy. Uh, this uh, was a patient on our study, uh, the first patient who was 67. Um, back in 2010, she presented with primary CNS lymphoma, had a left cerebellar lesion. Um, she was treated with high-dose methotrexate, progressed, got whole brain radiation treatment with high-dose cytarabine, had a CR with that for three years. And then uh, before she came to us, she relapsed with left temporal lobe disease and also had a systemic disease as well. Um, in that 14-day window, um, shown here is her MRI scan before and after ibrutinib alone. Um, and as you can see, this left temporal lobe lesion has significantly decreased after single-agent ibrutinib. This, uh, in terms of the TEDI or um, in, in, in patients where we could assess its activity um, and looking at CR or CRU, as you can see here, that was uh, very high. Um, this shows the 18 patients that we treated. Um, it's um, a little bit complicated. So the top, uh, these are the number of months the patients were on study. And then you can see 1 to 18 of the patients that we treated. Um, but, you know, you can see that um, th there, were, or, or there are a number of patients who remain in remission, including the very first patient who's in remission for over two years. Um, we did see toxicity on this study. Um, we saw um, a number of cases, um, interestingly, of invasive aspergillosis, and we're um, looking into that very carefully now and, um, you know, seeing if there's any relationship between ibrutinib and aspergillosis. So there are other groups that have also been looking at ibrutinib. Um, at MSK, uh, Dr. Groms and colleagues um, have been doing a study using single-agent ibrutinib. Uh, their study is not confined to primary CNS. They also uh, treat patients with um, systemic large cell who have CNS involvement. And uh, when they presented their results at ASCO this year, they have so far treated 10 patients. Um, seven have primary CNS and three have systemic uh, diffuse large B cell lymphoma with CNS involvement. And uh, they um, showed a high response rate in, bo in both primary CNS and systemic CNS. Um, I think as, as this study and the LISA group in France um, also have a study of ibrutinib in primary CNS and systemic CNS with CNS involvement. And as the results of these studies are available, I think it's going to be very interesting to see if those patients with uh, systemic uh, large cell who have CNS involvement respond as well to ibrutinib. I would predict that they don't because if you look at their mutational profiles, they don't have the, uh, or they don't have the same proportion of cases with MITE88 and CD79B. But it will be very interesting, I think, um, as time goes by to look at those results. What about lenalidomide? Um, this is another uh, novel agent that is um, very interesting in primary CNS lymphoma. A few groups have been uh, looking at the activity of this. I think that G Jim Rubenstein at UCSF um, was, was the first one who put together a study. Um, he combined it with rituximab in relapsed and refractory CNS lymphoma. Um, he also presented his results at ASCO this year and has so far treated um, 13 patients. Again, he 
um, tested it in both primary CNS and in systemic uh, large cell with CNS involvement. And um, he has so far shown a very high response rate um, in both primary CNS and in systemic uh, CNS with CNS involvement and has a number of patients whose remissions have been maintained um, beyond two years. Um, I think in terms of looking forward, I think this is a very interesting disease when you see the activity of these agents and I think uh, combining lenalidomide with ibrutinib um, is a very interesting strategy um, in this disease. I also think that immune checkpoint inhibitors are very interesting to think about and if you look at uh, PD-1 expression in primary CNS lymphoma, it's very high and I would predict that these agents may be, may be effective and have interesting activity in this disease. So, um, in conclusion, I think uh, there have been recently great strides in understanding the biology of primary CNS. I think that the field has completely taken off over the last few years thanks to insights into the biology of the disease uh, that we've learned over the last four or five years. And uh, this has really paved the way for um, exciting new and precision strategies. Um, I've spent a lot of talk talking about BTK inhibition, but it's very effective in this disease. Um, Jim Rubenstein has shown that IMIDs are very effective. Um, and I think that in terms of new treatments to think about, I think that PD-1 and PD-L1 antibodies and CAR T cell therapy may be very effective in this disease and are very interesting strategies. And uh, I think it, we, re we really need to move on from um, high-dose methotrexate and cytarabine and the the future challenge is to design uh, upfront trials um, with novel agents. Um, also, um, with these agents, with uh, BTK inhibitors and IMIDs, um, the, the studies, the study at MSK and the, and the French study, uh, they use maintenance uh, therapy. And I think that um, in our field, we need to in, really figure out if maintenance therapy it should be a part of standard treatment when, when we're using these novel agents in newly diagnosed patients. Thank you.